Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. And in a moment, we're going to go up to church and worship God. But first of all, I wanted to ask you all to pray. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed is that uh, there's a lot of anxiety around at the moment. Anxiety about coming out of COVID, about anxiety about getting back into uh, life and the general swing of things. And, and the pandemic's had a deep and uh, significant effect on everything. But it's also had a deep and significant effect on the church. At the moment, we're going through the process of shaped by God, thinking about how we live uh, with a much smaller budget in the diocese. And we've noticed that we're around 60% down on our children who attend church and significantly down on our adults. And we understand that people are struggling uh, to come back to church for various reasons. But we want to, I'd like to call the church to, and those who follow us online to a time of prayer. I've been reading Psalm 127. It's been a psalm that God's laid on my heart over recent months. And it says that we need to build as the Lord directs. And Nehemiah, remember, built the walls of Jerusalem very carefully with a good leadership team and kept a good watch. And God, I believe, is calling us to rebuild the church, but he's calling us to call the workers to the to the coalface and uh, to build with wisdom. Because if we don't, we labour in vain. We just toil with anxiety in our hearts. So we need to pray. We need to pray for the Lord to rebuild his church as he wants it built. And if you feel called to be part of the life of St Mary's, then please ring me talk to me. If you've never come to our church, please come. But we need most of all to be a praying church. So let's call uh, the church to a time of prayer, prayer for recovery and prayer for a rebuilding of God's church. Let's go up to church now and worship God together. Good morning, welcome to St Mary's on this Feast of Pentecost or Whitson, whichever you call it. Let's take time now to worship God together. Good morning, welcome to St Mary's on this Whitson uh, Pentecost tide. A reading from 2 Corinthians 1. God has made us one in Christ. He has set his seal upon us and as a, as a pledge of what is to come has given the Spirit to dwell in our hearts. Isn't that true? Today we celebrate the gift of God's Holy Spirit. So let's read together before we start our service the reading from Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a wind like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in one and other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? How then is it that we each of us hears them in his own native tongue. Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Pamphylia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jew and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have too, too much, would have had too much wine. Isn't it great that God sent his Holy Spirit to equip his church to make it ready for mission? And we need to pray God sends his Holy Spirit afresh on the church that he may equip us for the mission and the recovery that flows after COVID. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's sing our opening hymn together.
Now we've sung together, let's remind ourselves why we've gathered. We've come together as the family of God to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. But before we do any of that, we need to ask God to forgive us because this week we will have not loved the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind and strength, and we will not have loved our neighbour as much as we love ourselves. And if we deny that there's any sin in us, we're kidding ourselves. So let's ask God by his spirit to prompt in us the things we need to bring to confession this morning. Let's say the words on the screen together. Lord God, we've sinned against you. We've done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And with confidence, we can ask the Father of all mercies to cleanse us from our sin and to restore us in his image, to the praise and glory of his name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please go and get your Bibles. Uh, it's really important that as we study scripture, we have it in front of us. So go and get your Bibles and we'll read scripture together. Our reading this morning is from Romans 13, the first seven verses. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one... Who is an authority then do what is good and you will receive his approval for he is God's servant for your good but if you will do wrong be afraid of he who does not bear the sword in vain for he is the servant of God an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer therefore one must be in subjection not only to go avoid God's wrath but also for the sake of conscience for well, because of this, you also pay taxes for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to what them what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honour to whom honour is owed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Scripture. Turn with me please to Romans 13. And we're going to look at the next section in our series on money. We're going to look at the issue of taxes. But before we do that, we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would open your word to us and open our hearts to receive your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. There are two categories of people who complain about taxes. Men and women. Nobody loves paying their taxes. But let's just recap briefly on where we've got to. We've talked about everything belonging to God and we need to, we've talked about the fact we need to keep our eyes fixed on God's and not on the things of this earth. So what do we do about when we come to pay taxes and revenues and things like bills? 
And do we have to view paying taxes as affirming that Boris, or even somebody as bad as Hitler, is God's man? By paying our taxes, do we endorse people? And is this passage asking us for blind obedience? Because it opens with the words, every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instu instituted by God. I want to quote a chaplain of, a universe, of the United States Senate. Be sure men will abuse and misuse the institution of the state, just as man, because of sin, has abused and misused every other institution in history, including the Church of Jesus Christ. But this does not mean that the institution is bad or that it should be forsaken. It simply means that men are sinners and rebels in God's world. And this is the way they behave with good institutions. As a matter of fact, it is because of this very sin that there must be human government to maintain order in history until the final ultimate rule of Jesus Christ is established. Government, human as it is, is better than anarchy and the Christian must recognise the divine right of the state. So at this starting point, what we recognise is not that Boris or Putin or anybody is ordained by God, but the nature of government is ordained by God. It's not necessarily a case of blind obedience, it's commitment to a system which God has ordained, not the men who seem to be in it, because because of sinful men, government is tainted. But there are three areas which I want to set out at the beginning of, of where, where three cases where men do not have to accept the authority of those in power. First of all, if somebody who's in power, Boris or Hitler or whoever, asks you to violate a direct command of God, then you are perfectly correct within your Christian conscience to refuse to obey. That is not to reject the institution of government, but the direction of those in power. And the great image of that comes from Acts 4, verses 17 to 20. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in his name. That's the elders in Jerusalem speaking of Peter after the Pentecost. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. For as for us, we cannot help speaking out about what we have seen and heard. The direct command of God takes precedence over the command of government and there are no exceptions to this rule. Secondly, a Christian must resist when there is an immoral act required of him. This is ethical areas, including things like falsifying records. So if you work for the Department of uh, Health or for pensions or whatever, or you're involved in, in local government, and you're required to falsify or carry out an immoral act, perjury, for instance, covering up for your subordinates by means of falsehoods, Christian must never think it's okay to commit immoral or unethical acts simply because the states requested it. So you can reject the request of those in power if that's the case. And finally, they must never, Christians must never go against their Christian conscience in order to obey the government. This could involve such diverse things as particip participation in licentious entertainment or working in institutions that form wholesale, maybe abortion, or things like that, working perhaps with nuclear weapons. Believers must never sin against their conscience. So our conclusion is that Christians must disobey the government when they commit certain acts, but they are disobeying the people, but they are called in verses one and two to a profound obedience subject to the state because statehood and government is the institution ordained by God and has a divine right. With right understanding, Christians should be the best citizens there are because it requires profound submission to God, which will involve obedience to the state. Committed Christians will con continuously live with attention here. 
you will live with a tension between your desire to obey God and to respect the office of government with the tension which is our direct issues regarding obeying those in power. The greatest example of this is Jesus obeying the opposing Pilate. Jesus makes clear to Pilate that he only has power because God's given it to him, but he subjects himself to Pilate's authority. It can be summed up in the phrase, tyranny is better than anarchy. Anarchy often seems quite attractive, doesn't it? It does to a sinful man. What does anarchy actually mean? Well, it means the absence of government, and it was uh, brought about by a Frenchman, Pierre-Joseph Poudon, who wrote a book, a treaty called What is Property? Uh, and it refers to a new political system and a social movement which advocates statelessness. It advocates stateless societies based on free and voluntary associations. Anarchists seek a system based on the abolishment of justify, unjustified coercive hierarchies and creation of a system of direct democracies and workers' cooperatives. It still sounds like government to me. It still sounds like a system of government. Add to that taxes and then we'll come to the main point of our sermon. But what's the point of this system, which even anarchists exist, say needs to exist? Well, let's move back to our passage, to chapter four, uh, verse 4. For he is God's servant for your good, but if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but for the sake of conscience. In simple terms, government is exist, exists. It often speaks about being the servant of the people, but it is the deacon, the servant of God, to carry out God's rule on earth to better humanity. It should be promoting God's design for the world, that is family life and godly living. As one commentator put it, the darkest days in Israel's history are when those, those described in Judges 6, 17, verse 6, when everyone did as he saw fit, just a few days, a few hours, without a law in today's world, and all would be chaos just in the book of Judges. We need government, and government has a purpose, which is to operate the system that God has put in place. And that good includes caring for the sick, educating children, looking after the poor, it also is given, as is shown in this reading in uh, verses 4 and 5, to punish the wrongdoer. That's why it's right the government should have magistrates and police. And if we do nothing wrong, if we live in good conscience with the state, we have nothing to fear. But if we do live in, 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 in the wrong way, then we have something to fear. Imagine you're driving... <coughs> Uh, at a 30 mile an, hour, mile an hour zone at 50, 55 miles an hour, or if you're doing 70, uh, 80, sorry, in a 70 mile an hour zone, you have something to fear because the authorities have the right to punish you for your wrongdoing. So, thus, uh, so far as Paul is, is concerned, we're called to profound, intelligent obedience to government, verse 1 and 2, the government that's meant to serve us, verse 3 and 4, and then in 5 and set to 7, he describes the kind of obedience to which we're called to, to that government. So in 6 and 7, we read, For because of this you may or you also pay taxes for the authorities and ministers of God according to this very thing. Pay to all who are owed them, taxes to those who, ta who taxes are owed, revenue to those who are revenue are owed, respect to those who respect his own honour to those who honour his own. When I complete my tax return and my PAYE goes out of my bank account, it is an act of obedience to the will of God because it funds government. The passage tells us they give up their time to carry out a godly ordained, make a godly ordained system work. And my taxes avoid them from being involved in corruption. Not paying my taxes is a serious action against God as much as it is against the government. It shows my rebellion against the lawful and God-ordained system of government. 
save for the exceptions I've set out when we can uh, in good conscience disobey those in, in power over us, we are committed to pay our taxes because that sustains a system of government which is good. There is another reason why we should pay our taxes, because we are good citizens. And the one thing that always gets the church good press and benefits the gospel is when we live as good citizens. It gets us a hearing at the top table. It gets us that sense of that Christians are not there to rebel and overturn society. So what's the application for today? The application is really simple. It is to pay your taxes. It is to pay your revenue. It is to pay for your gas bill when it comes and keep yourself in good order. And that is make us think about how we live our lives. We live our lives in society at the moment where we can have whatever we want on credit, but that causes us to build up large amounts of debt. And then there may be a moment when you can't pay the gas bill or you can't pay the tax man and you have to get into debt and you have to then get into the situation where maybe the bailiff is even called to take away your furniture to cover the debt that's owed. That looks really bad for the church. That looks really bad for the gospel because it makes us look irresponsible and it means we're buying into the world's values, not into godly values. It also, what we've learned this morning, challenges our view of government. How do you see the government? Well, you can see Boris as being an evil dictator, or you can see Jeremy Corbyn as a threat to civilised society. But actually, it's not that that we're learning about this morning. It's not that we're paying our taxes for. I'm not paying my taxes for Boris Johnson, or for Keir Starmer, or for anybody else. I'm paying my taxes to support a system of government that is ordained by God. As for, if we look back, all the way back to the Old Testament, when Moses is in the desert uh, with the Israelites, he is given authority to judge their disputes. There is government and order, and God intends that to happen. And the, one of the ways that happens in our country is through the funding that's received from the tax system. So therefore, it's a great challenge this morning that we are to give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and we can give unto Christ and God that which is God's. We can see where Jesus' teaching is coming from, can't we? He recognises that actually Caesar, evil as he might be, is still part of a system of government that is ordained by God. And it can operate for good. So if we look at the timing of Jesus' coming, there is one world government. I know there's big issues with that uh, in today's society and, and issues with people believing in a great reset. But actually, if you look at it, the system of government allowed Paul to travel. It allowed the gospel to spread. So it performed good in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It performed good in the mission of the church. An ordered society allows the church to operate well, or allows the church to share the gospel clearly. So please uh, pray for the government and pray for Boris and pray for those who lead the nation. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Let's turn to the, the uh, creeds and let's declare our faith, the words that describe the core of our belief. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and he is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us turn to prayer and ask for God to hear us 
as we come with joy in our hearts. From Habakkuk 2. Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets, so that the herald may run with it, for the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. For it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. See, the enemy is puffed up, his desires are not upright, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. Lord, you are great and most worthy of praise, and we, your people, ascribe to you glory and honour and majesty. For you are the one true God, the maker of heaven and earth, and you and you alone are due our allegiance and our worship. We praise you throughout the ages. You have required the same thing from your people, faith and trust in you and in your word. From Adam and the garden you required faith. From Israel during the time of Habakkuk you required faith, and from us now you require faith. However, Lord, we confess that even as your requirement of faith has been consistent, our failure to meet that requirement has been consistent. Adam didn't trust your word in the garden, and so sin entered the world. Israel didn't trust you and your word, and so you exiled them out of their land. And we too, Lord, like them, are often guilty of lack of faith. Father, our lack of faith is reflected in our worries, stresses and fears, and these so often consume us. We worry about the future post-pandemic, about our jobs, our children, whether we will achieve what we want to achieve. We stress about the present, how our relationships are not going as well as we hope they would, how we're perceived by others and how we will manage the workload of our busy lives. And we fear the unknown, what will happen tomorrow, whether or not we will handle what's coming next. Father, our tendency is to dwell on things like these, to focus on them instead of focusing on you, the one who sustains all things by your mighty power. Help us to put our faith and trust in you, your ability to provide for us in every way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, forgive us for our tendency not to trust you. Forgive us and restore in us hearts that are prone, not to wander from you, but to wait faithfully upon you and to trust your good providence. Free us from our tendency to walk by sight and to see the path, to want to see the path ahead, to know the particulars of it. Instead, give us eyes and hearts that are content to walk by faith, even when that means we cannot see the future. Lord, we pray for those here today who are struggling with various issues. We pray for those with concerns about jobs. Lord, give them faithful faith to trust and rest in your sustaining providence. We pray for, the, with the, for those with concerns about relationships. Give them faith to forgive where necessary or to ask for forgiveness. We pray for those whose hearts hurt for one reason or another. May you put lenses of faith over their eyes, through which they may view their pain. Not lenses that ignore pain, but lenses that put it into proper perspective. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Most of all, Lord, we pray for those in our town and villages in Sarby, Cossington and Seagrave, who have not put their faith in you for this life and for the next. We pray for those who have not turned from their rebellion against you and have not yet trusted Jesus for their salvation. Lord, would you give them eyes of faith to turn to you and find forgiveness and life everlasting? And Father, we pray for ourselves that we know maybe not we may not be puffed up people who trust in ourselves, but maybe people characterized by radical faith in you. And so merciful Father. Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us, the family prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We've prayed together, now let us sing our closing song and then we will ask for God's blessing. In my wrestling and in my doubts In my failures you won't walk out Your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa, You are the peace in my troubled sea In the silence you won't let go In the questions your truth will hold Your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa, You are the peace in my troubled sea My lighthouse, my lighthouse Shining in the darkness, I will follow you to show
we close our time of worship together, let's hear the special prayer for today, the collect for the Feast of Pentecost. God, who, as at this time, did teach the hearts of your faithful people by sending them the light of your Holy Spirit, grant us the same Spirit to have right judgment in all things and to evermore rejoice in his holy comfort through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Saviour, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let's ask for God's blessing. The Spirit of truth lead us into all truth. Let it give us grace to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and strengthen us to proclaim the word and works of God. And may the blessing of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. May God bless your week to you and thank you for being with us this morning. Can you imagine churches across the UK and Ireland joining together for a focused month of mission? A mission that involves thousands of Christians who continue in a lifetime of confidently sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with those around them. This is the vision of A Passion for Life 2022. And we'd love you and your church to join us. The global pandemic has exposed our culture's weaknesses, vulnerabilities and fears. We've been brought face to face with our own mortality and the false gods that we put our hope in have let us down. Whilst it's been incredibly painful and many of us have suffered in all kinds of ways, it has also brought home to us the preciousness of the hope we have in Christ. And wonderfully, it has created new opportunities to proclaim the gospel to the lost people that we are all connected with in our everyday lives. Our Saviour, Jesus, has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This is the message we have, the good news of life in Christ. It is the message that a passion for life is all about. And it's a message our nation desperately needs to hear. A passion for life calls churches across the UK and Ireland to come together in our mission to proclaim Christ. Beginning in early 2021 with helping our churches develop a culture of mission followed later in the year by opportunities and resources for personal evangelism training. And all of this leading up to a focused month of mission in the run up to Easter 2022. Already hundreds of churches and ministry leaders in many different contexts have begun thinking about how to make use of this mission opportunity. It might seem a long way off, but Easter 2022 is really only just around the corner, especially when it comes to church ministry planning. And because of that, we are already working to make sure that you will have the resources you need to help your church get ready this year for the mission next year. As local churches engage together in mission, our aim, our passion, is to stimulate and resource all year round evangelism. We pray that the legacy of a passion for life will be a lifetime of gospel sharing across our nations and beyond. And we pray that you and your church will join us on this journey. So we'd love you to join this growing movement of churches and their leaders who are already coming together on mission to bring the message of Jesus to every community in the UK and Ireland. Join us as we all get ready for A Passion for Life 2022. A month of mission, a lifetime of evangelism. This is A Passion for Life. Thank you.